to our panel Seeking Justice and Documentary. My name is Claire Aguilar, and I'm the Director of Programming and Policy at the IDA, which is the International Documentary Association. And I'm very pleased to have this panel of uh, filmmakers and a film scholar with us today to talk about our theme, which is Seeking Justice in Documentary. And having been in Ashland for um, a little over 24 hours, I see that this is a theme that <coughs> Um, seems to resonate a lot with, um, with you all and with um, the community and also with a lot of the films that you've been seeing, especially the documentaries. So um, before we start, I wanted to just uh, swiftly uh, introduce our, our uh, panelists and we'll go into it. Um, I'll start with the person directly alongside of me who is Betsy McLean and um, Betsy is um, a uh, film scholar and um, educator, and has al also been involved in documentary for many, many years. Um, she used to be the executive director of the IDA for many years, long before I was there, and um, her moniker is the diva of documentary. Uh, <laughs> or documentary diva, I think. Either works. <laughs> and um, she currently, uh, she's, she's written a book which is uh, called the um, a new history of documentary film, and this film, uh, this this book is a seminal uh, book for all people interested in documentary. And also, she currently teaches at the University of Southern Oregon now, and her students are taping us. So thank you very much. <laughs> um, and next to Betsy is Gilda Brash. Uh, Gilda is a filmmaker who has a, a film in the in the festival called Let My People Vote, a portrait of a um, ex-felon and um, uh, a radical uh, vote per person to urge on the vote in the elections of 2016. And that film is showing as part of the shorts program. I see that it is showing on Saturday. Today at 6 o'clock. 20, yes. 20, but get there at yeah. 6. So, so check it out. And vote for us. And them too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Gilda. And so, and next to Gilda is um, Lindy Grazel. And Lindsay is the director of a film called The Reluctant Radical. And that is showing in the festival too, portrait of a um, environmentalist turned radical activist. Um, and she'll be, uh, we'll see a trailer of her film and we'll talk about her film, really interesting. Her subject may be with us also. He is, he's right there. Oops. Yay, hit that, yeah, we'll hear from, this is her subject of the reluctant, he is the reluctant radical. So, <laughs> um, and then next to, next to Lindsay is uh, Michael Palmieri. And Mike is the director of the Gospel of Eureka which is showing at the festival um, many times, but it's showing, uh, let's see, it's showing today at it's three. Rush, it's three o'clock showing it's today. Rush. Sorry? It's in Rush. It's in Rush. They added a screening on Monday, I think. At a, one of, oh, it, okay. Monday also. Yeah, and the Gospel of Eureka profiles a, a, small, um, a small community in Eureka, Arkansas which is a, um, a fundamentalist Christian community, but also has a, a very active um, gay LGBTQ bar. Mm -hmm. So um, those are the films. And now we'll, we can show the trailers. We'll show the trailers from the three films. Okay, thank you, John. <laughs> Everyone loves a good story now and then. But what if I told you this was a place where stories come to life? Would you believe it? And now I want to present to you the great passion play. I am here. you're a Christian doesn't really have anything to do with, with who you're fucking. It has to do with who you're loving. We're getting too permissive in this town, and I don't like it.
God has no problem with me. I had to live life as a woman. Hola, titty. She sweat like a whore in church. And I say to my Christian friends in my community, who are we? Are we Judas or are we Christ? got to vote as if your life depend on it because it do. For, for African Americans, it do. If we don't vote, then we end up having to live in a situation where there are policies that cause us to be gunned down in the street like animals. That's the most offensive thing I've seen in the last 30 years. What's up, buddy? All right, all right. Today is the last day of early voting, right? To where people can vote anywhere, right? We won't change the leadership for brown and black people in this community. But according to this list, these people haven't voted yet. Your vote is our voice. Bam, let's rock it. That's how we do this thing. One vote at a time. We can't vote. No. Because we got a record. Right. You know, so it, just because we can't vote, that don't mean we got to be silenced, right? Yeah, it's right. It is so easy to get a felony in Florida. They say you come to Florida on vacation, you leave on probation. My name is Desmond Mead. How you doing, brother? Well, your vote going to count today, bro. Yeah. If I, if, if I wasn't, my knees weren't bad, I'd I just carry on my back, <laughs> you know? So what's up, Facebook family? He is a registered voter. And so he's allowing us to take him to the polls to go and vote. We're on the trail, Papa. We're going to make sure everybody who want to vote get the opportunity to vote. We got an issue now. They turned him away. And the supervisor of elections erroneously turned him away. You know what it is, man? Driver was suspended license. This was back in 93. We think that once you do your time, yeah. you get the right to, you should have the right to vote. A plea bargain is not justice, and that's what we want. That's what we're looking for. You guys like my dad, man. Fuck. How in the hell are you gonna do a black man like that? How are you gonna do a human being like that? To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain. That's a frustration, man. Everybody else get to vote. We can't vote. I was going, hey, wait a minute, <laughs> the world's in collapse here, and we're not doing anything about it. And people were like, oh, yeah, that's, that's a problem. And there was a sense of utter disconnected in realities. Climate change is just dealt with as if it was any other discrete environmental issue. For years, we said we could solve this if everyone would just put the right light bulbs and buy a Prius. Life in your morning up, maybe. <laughs> what we really needed to be doing was, from the very beginning, raising hell. All right, grab rest. Eight hours of community service, and then they'll dismiss, as if they had never been filed, the charges. In theory, I could just show up and do this every two weeks or so if I wanted. Well, I've got the 2.30 in the morning thinking, why am I doing this? Nobody's gonna care, nobody's gonna notice. One, two, three, four, five postcard boots. Next. 
if you've done all the legal available methods and they don't work, then the only thing that you have left is to put your body in the way. I feel a large amount of pride for what my dad does because save the world and all that. The odds are vanishingly small. I mean, we really are basically fucked. But that's no excuse for not figuring out what to do next, so. One man can't do this. He's speaking to Life is hard for zealots. Some of my heroes in history were zealots. The suffragettes, the abolitionists. Makes him hard to love, but it also makes him worth loving, I guess. He's dedicated, he's articulate, he's passionate, and he's guilty. I'm now showing Exhibit 18 to the jury. We need moral clarity. We need sides to be drawn. Either you're for burning fossil fuels and ending the world, or you're against it. Which is it? Of, of films that we have here. If you haven't seen them already, please go check them out. They'll be playing various times. Um, it, the, the program, can you hear me? No? I don't think it's on. It's not on? Okay. Better? Yeah? Is it on now? Closer. Let me take out of the Is that better? No, it's, no, not, it's on. not on. This one's on. Okay. Test, test. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Hi, so um, as you can see, the program is really sprinkled with a lot of these themes, the social issue themes throughout the program. There are so many films that um, talk about ways of establishing social equity and the injustices around us. Um, these are, these are a, kind of a sample of uh, different, kind of, uh, different kind of ways that uh, filmmakers are expressing their their ways of, um, uh, of um, exploring social justice. Why don't we start with Lindsay? Um, that was your trailer for The Reluctant Radical. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about the ways that you started this film. You have, you've said that you started to make a film about uh, climate change, and it changed into something else. Well, no, actually, I met, I met Ken, and I was um, Im impressed with what he was saying about climate change that made me think about it differently. And um, I decided to make a short film, just a character portrait of him. And I thought it would be you know, a 10 or 15 minute thing and that would be the end of it. And um, right after I approached Ken and, and asked him and he gave me permission to do that, um, I was like, I'm really busy right now. I have three other projects. Let's start this in October. And then it was literally like three days later, Shell Oil announced that they were bringing one of their ships to be repaired in Portland. And Ken started a plan on how to prevent that ship from leaving the city. And so I just dropped all my other projects and followed him for a week as, as he was making his plans um, to stop that. And it turned into a huge event because Greenpeace got involved and had 13 activists rappelling from a bridge to stop that ship. So it was, um, and then I was like, wow, this is, this is wildly dramatic and <laughs> has great visuals. And, and from there, Ken just continued to do um, interesting things and it turned into a bigger and bigger project. How did you meet Ken? We just met socially and started talking. Yeah. <laughs> Great. This is the way films are made. And during the production of the film, you had your own episode of you were arrested and in the production. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so um, the culmination of the film, Ken and four other activists worked together to shut down all of the tar sands oil pipelines coming into this country from Canada. And um, I was filming him along with my cameraman and we were arrested after Ken was arrested and um, charged with the exact same charges, which were three felonies and a misdemeanor. And uh, spent a night in jail. And um, it was uh, obviously a really big deal for me personally, but it was also a big deal because, you know, as a filmmaker, to see, see another filmmaker be arrested for simply filming someone else doing something that was illegal raised all kinds of First Amendment issues, of course. So um, I had assumed that uh, once they had sorted out that I was the filmmaker, 
that I would just be, you know, sort of let go that afternoon. In fact, in the police car, I was already scheming about how long this is going to take before I was going to get out and I was going to be able to get the footage of Ken coming out of jail. <laughs> but it didn't work out that way at all, and I had to get lawyers and... Um, my Dea Schlossberg, who became my co-producer, was also arrested in North Dakota when she was filming the activists there shutting down the Keystone Pipeline on that same day. Mm -hmm. um, there was the, the interesting thing for me in terms of the, the social justice piece, obviously I feel really strongly that our First Amendment rights are hugely important and this was a case of them um, you know, being challenged. But I didn't want to turn the film into a film about First Amendment rights. And so many people were so excited about the First Amendment angle of it and sort of were encouraging me to completely sort of change course of the story um, mid-ship or very late ship. And so that was uh, just something I had to work through for myself, knowing that that's not really what I wanted to do. And at the same time, I did want to like speak up and talk about how important it is that we, you know, are able to do our work without being threatened with jail time. And has this experience made you feel that you are, like, um, you know, in terms of being a radical activist filmmaker, is that a label that you would welcome, or does it depend upon I, the I, project that you're working on or the circumstances? I actually don't feel, uh, I don't label myself as an activist at all, and that's not, um, that's, I have more shame in that than anything. I mean, I have a lot of um, admiration for activists, and I don't feel like I've walked that path in my life. Um, but I do want my films to make an impact and a, and a positive impact in the world, and so, I felt like by amplifying Ken's work and his vision that I could make make my own contribution in the ways that I'm best able to, which is by telling his story. So um, I think a lot of other people are quick to label me as a radical activist filmmaker, but I think I'm just a filmmaker. <laughs> That's fair enough. Um, let's go to let's go to Mike Palmieri. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, so Michael's the co-director of the Gospel of Eureka, which is, as I said, a set in um, Arkansas, Gospel Arkansas. And why don't you tell us about the genesis of this film? Um, this can you guys? Oh, yeah. has mine now gone away? No. Is, <laughs> it's okay. Okay. Yeah. Now there's two. Um, <laughs> this this film started out uh, about three years ago. Um, Laura Poitras asked me and Donald to go down to uh, Eureka Springs, Arkansas to cover a civil rights ordinance that was happening in a city where they were basically passing basic civil pr protections for the LGBT community. And um, so we were sort of covering this issue, but we got down there and there was this giant statue of Jesus on a hill, and then we found out that they were doing like a passion play four nights out of the week there. And we're like, okay, this place is interesting. Um, so we, we covered that ordinance in the short film sort of covers that information. But what we found to be very interesting, much more interesting than just that basic political material was that everyone in the town was Christian. So the LGBT community there, basically everybody was Christian as well. And so we thought it would be more interesting to spend time with a community this diverse and strange that where everyone was Christian and trying to negotiate their differences while living in a small community. So that's basically took another three years to sort of cover that, really about revealing more similarities than differences. So, yeah. Starting out as a short and sort of refocusing into that theme of um, you were saying that the film doesn't take kind of traditional um, ways of telling that story. Uh, now there are a lot of efforts for people to speak to each other from other sides of the aisle, so to speak, especially with religion and um, gay and lesbian issues and trans issues. Those, there's not a lot of aisle space there, but this film does that. I mean, is this yeah. something you discovered as you were making the feature, the longer film? Well, I mean, I guess one of the the things I'm always interested in are how do you you know how do you explore an issue in a way that's that's different? And currently, 
the, in, the political environment we're all living under is it's everything is <coughs> is, is, so, is so polarized, and so it's very easy to make films that are like polemic, you know. Um, and so I I guess what interested us the most was just like okay cool so there are these crazy right wing evangelicals but like. What do they think? Like, what are they thinking? What do they believe? So here are these gospels that they follow. Like, let's look at the story. Let's look at what they, you know, what they believe in. And then what became interesting was, oh, wow, everyone, this is the South, so, you know, everyone knows their Bible there. And, but the LGBT community, they all were Christians. So I was like, well, hold on a second. There's got to be a way of, you know, seeing how there can be a, a conversation. There's, there's some through line there that's not being conveyed to the average, you know, a viewer of films or just the average reader of articles and stuff. And I feel like we found that there. I mean, I think there's, just, there's much more similarity than difference in any community, but especially like in small communities where everybody has to get along and stuff. Um, and, you know, look, honestly, the right-wing evangelical CEO of the Passion Play is somebody who I vehemently disagree with on his positions on gay rights and all sorts of things. But I mean, we, I can disagree with him and still have a conversation with him and still be reasonable, you know? And I felt like the more you're reasonable with somebody, the more they're willing to tell you more about themselves, which is much more complicated. It's too easy to just attack you know it's it's so it's so simple to take someone down like that as a filmmaker i mean the man is wearing a naga hide coat and he's you know showing he he's he's like a carnival barker in if you want to show him that way but he's not he's a complicated individual who believes in something and has been politicized a certain way so how do you show that how do you make that complicated and then what the, the pleasure of this film is ultimately that everyone is doing a drag show, whether they're an evangelical Christian <laughs> or not. So, so I'm talking all serious here, but listen, there's a lot of fun in this movie, you know. So, but you know, everybody is uh, is performing their faith in this film. So there's a lot of through lines. Yeah, that's a great phrase, performing their faith through this film. Yeah, yeah you see this stylistically in the film a lot, in the editing, and also in the in the look and the narration, which you which you caught a little bit of, which is, which is which is a really interesting tone. It's sort of both fairy tale kind of camp, but yeah. not, and you know, just really interesting. Your narrator is great. It's uh, Justin Vivian Bond, who um, is a very um, famous trans performer uh, in New York, and an incredible voiceover talent. <laughs> we had an hour with them, and they knocked it out of the park. So yeah, well done. Uh, so great. Let's go to let's go to Gilda. So Gilda, you have your your show. Please vote for me, or not? Please vote for me. Let my people vote. Yes. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> please vote for me. Well, t tell us about how you came to make this film, and the timeline. Yeah. Okay. So this first of all, it's a, it's on the shorts program, so it's kind of buried in there at six twenty. It's not like and and I'm glad I'm not in competition with you guys because those <laughs> sound those sound amazing. And I will definitely be seeing yours. Um, and I, I love I love the whole energy of this panel. But um, so how did we first do this? Um, this was back coming up on the election in 2016, and um, I live probably in your sister community of California, which is Venice Beach. And I was sitting there in the organic Air One Cafe having <laughs> my um, people next to me are having their $6.50 coffee with this special coconut oil and the MCT added and the whole thing. And I'm being kind of cheap. I didn't want to go over $3.50. And um, so I'm just listening to the conversation. And Hillary had been nominated. Bernie was out. And my peers were sitting there saying, you know, I don't like either of them. I, I'm, I'm just going to sit this one out. I wish that it had been Bernie. And this just really resonated with me because I've, I've filmed a lot in the South. Um, one of the other things I've done is um, um, executive produced a series on VH1 called Love and Hip Hop. And um, particularly in the Atlanta version of Love and Hip Hop, 
I just felt the shadow of the Confederacy over me all the time. And even with my black crew members today, we would go certain places and there'd be a giant Confederate flag over a gas station. And I'm thinking like, okay, how does that make them feel? This was before all the statues started coming down. And so when I'm hearing comments like this and I'm realizing, and, and the film by the way is dedicated to uh, uh, Reverend Dr. King, um, you know, I was like, people marched and they died for this right to vote. And we are lucky, you know, for the most part, we have white privilege. So whether we vote or not, we're probably going to be okay to some degree. But there are people like, you know, Desmond says that, you know, it's a matter of, um, of, of, of your life does depend on it in certain ways. So then... Um, this was getting close to the election. We're towards the end of September here, the election's November 8th. I went around, I did some pitches to Netflix and others, and everyone was like, oh my gosh, we don't have enough runway. And I didn't know how this was gonna happen, and I was gonna give up. And I swear it was almost like the ghost of King came to me at night and was just like, go, you're a documentarian, go turn your cameras on. Just go turn the camera on. Get a camera and go turn it on. And um, so amazingly, one of our, um, uh, the board members of the IDA um, lent me five amazing, or was it six amazing Sony state-of-the-art 4K cameras. And 24 hours before we went down there, I had a ticket. Um, a wonderful donor came forward. And I crewed up real quick. And we got out the door. And um, so that, the, the, the short that we did is actually one of five characters that were filmed before the election. And it's really so amazing, I think, in its verite pureness in that it is a story with the beginning, middle, and end. We just followed him. We had no idea what was going to happen. So it was a, a roller coaster walk through this neighborhood, and um, that's pretty much how it happened. How did you choose Desmond and the other characters? Um, well, once we started, you know, quote, the casting, um, I was looking for um, characters from all walks of life and from both sides of the political spectrum and in between, um, lots of diversity. And so Desmond and his wife um, came to me through a professor at the um, University of Central Florida. And they were like, hey, you should, you should talk to this couple, Desmond and his wife, Sheena. She had actually run for office. Um, she had lost, but she had already done a run. And I was impressed by, he was already starting to um, um, make some waves in the press. And one of his quotes was, my wife ran for office and I couldn't even vote for her. And, and his crimes were, were nonviolent. So then, you know, continuing on in the casting as documentarians, we have to find people that kind of live inside out, that are able to articulate their story. And He's actually one of the best emoters and articulators that I've ever come across. So um, as soon as I met them, I'm like, okay, you know, you're in. You're, you're my representation of disenfranchised voter suppression minority. He's pretty remarkable. <laughs> yeah. Is he still continuing his um, work? Oh, right yes, now? yes. I, um, I don't want to spoil the ending, but... Um, don't spoil the ending. Oh, the, it, very interestingly enough, you can look it up. Um, just in the last week, there was a column by George Will, Washington Post, very, very conservative columnist who I have thrown things at when he's been on the TV. Um, <laughs> but amazingly enough, in this Washington Post column, just this last week, he came out in support of reenfranchisement. He said there is absolutely no reason to disenfranchise um, basically at 6.1 million ex-felons that didn't get to vote in the 2016 election. Which actually brings a question to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you get your charges can I ask her a question? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yes, I'll, please. Okay. <laughs> can I, can, um, did you get your charges reduced, or are you still in a felony classification? They were, they were all dropped about a month after I was arrested. Okay. So that's one of the things that we explore in this mm -hmm. film and that um, you know, a lot of the activists down there are articulating. When you're a minority and you, you like I heard you say, you, know, you hired a lawyer. So Florida has so many frivolous felonies, um, you know, driving with a suspended license, trying to be a nice person and putting a sea turtle egg back in a nest, uh, burning a tire in public, um, touching a spiny lobster trap, um, 
actually possession of cannabis or even a tiny bit of cannabis in a pipe before now medical marijuana is legal, but if you don't have the card, that's, that's a third degree felony. So, you know, we kind of were educated. We know the system. We have resources. You know, you got a lawyer, they were reduced. But what happens in minority communities, which is why I think this panel is so great to bring out these issues of criminal justice, is that you do take the plea bargain. You have no idea how you're going to hire a lawyer. So to plea bargain means, in case you don't know, that you plead guilty. So as soon as you plead guilty because you think, okay, the, the public defender just told me if I plead guilty, then I'm only going to do whatever it is, six months or whatever, yada, da, 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 you, you take it. And then you, you don't vote. As long as you live in Florida, you never vote again. And um, actually, the other kind of cool thing, this is very timely, um, Florida and Rick Scott, the Governor Rick Scott, who was about to run for senator, um, he actually has, th there's clemency hearings where people can come to him. There's actually a great, if you Google it, uh, Samantha Bee did a great piece on all this. Oh yeah, okay, cool. So she had great footage where they're coming forward to Rick Scott and they're saying, okay, I did this. It, you know, it actually sounds kind of frivolous. I turned my life around. And he bangs down the gavel and he goes, so glad you've turned your life around. Clemency denied. So he is now um, being charged by a federal judge, Walker, and the state of Florida that their, their decisions on restoring um, voting rights, and basically it's a whole package of rights, you get to also, Desmond can't practice law. You lose that too. And you can't run for public office as well as not voting. So um, Governor uh, Scott is now under fire by this federal judge to actually hold more and approve more clemencies because his rate is lower than any governor before him, including uh, Jeb Bush. So um, the whole issue in Florida is blowing up. Okay, Florida, stay to watch. And George Will. <laughs> Turn it around, George Will. Um, so great. Let, well, let's talk to Betsy. Betsy, you've um, you've been in the documentary field for for a long time. You've probably seen the trend. What are your impressions about the um, social issues coming out in documentary? And there's been a long tradition of working with social issues from the very beginning, from Yoris Stevens, from all these different filmmakers, but there is, there is a certain kind of spark, wouldn't you say, of what's happening now in documentary? Yeah, I would say that we're in a moment of time where the voices of documentarians um, of a variety of sorts are really necessary and that they're being heard. And these are three different types of approaches to tackling what we call a social issue, which um, there are many types of documentaries, and, and some are not at all about social issues, and some become that, even though they might start out as something else or uh, turn into something else. And what I'm interested in with a kind of mega view of this is you are different sorts of filmmakers who approach your subjects in different ways. How do you get the ability, you explained how you got the cameras, et cetera, but how do you find a context within our current society to um, have the resources to make documentaries that have a point of view? Um, it's hard enough to get any documentary funded. It doesn't matter what it is. Very few people have it easy to do that. So I'm, I'm really interested in the ways they fund these and, and then get them out. You put everything on the line and spend all your money until you have a story. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's true, though. I mean, it's very hard to get funding, obviously, in, doc, in the world of docs. But you do. Um, so what, what, well, what, did, what did you usually, do? Actually, what happens is you don't. For the majority of the time, you don't. Mm. And you, tell, you're, you write for grants. You write all sorts of things for grants all the time, explaining what you're going for, what you're going to do. And then nobody gives you any money. And then you finish the film. And then you go, see, I was making this all along. And they go, oh, that. Oh, here's some money. <laughs> so, so by the end, you get a little bit, and you kind of get a little bit back. Um, I definitely make uh, money on the side doing commercial work, anything from editing to shooting for people, uh, working on other people's documentaries, if they're funded. <laughs> um, but uh, 
you know, so it's, it's, a, it's a hard road, but <coughs> the, the subject matter chooses you because if you, get, if you really get interested in something, at least for me, you get into something, you just get interested in something and then everything, you know, goes down the rabbit hole because it's interesting, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, I, I can't believe that I've had the chance to go to the places I've gone because I was interested in something and then people have opened their lives up to me and I've learned things. It's, it's like a form of education, you know. I mean, that's incredible. Why, I mean, why would anybody let you into their house to film them? I'm still always like totally blown away by that. But, but they do because you actually are interested in them and you get to know them for many, many months before you turn a camera on, right? So, like, I'm friends with all these people still. I'm friends with all the people, all the films that I've made. I would never know these people if I wasn't just somehow mm -hmm. the intersection occurred and the interest was there. How long did you spend with them in Eureka? What was the time period it was that about you three stayed? years. Three it, years yeah. from the time you were researching to... Uh, yeah, and then not full-time, no way. I mean, um, but... I think we went back there 10 times, um, and usually for about seven to 10 days at a time. Um, and then you're in constant contact with people all the time, you know, in, in the interim. Um, and still, I mean, like uh, uh, Kent, who plays Jesus in this film, I just saw him um, a month ago in Portland. I had lunch with, with Jesus himself, and uh, <laughs> he's doing good, you know. I paid for... <laughs> no free lunch from Jesus? <laughs> no. No, I was, gonna, I was gonna pick that check up, just in case. <laughs> and what did, did the mood change? I, I assumed it did during time, or what was, the, what was the vibe like, the receptivity at first? It seems like a, it would be a welcoming town anyway. Yeah, I mean, it is. It's not like there was really an issue or a problem. I mean, the Passion Play completely were like, oh, awesome, come on in, film with us. And they actually allowed us to film. So the play happens like four nights a week, and they're, it's, it's somewhat sparsely attended most of the time. But, you know, it's a giant set, but everybody's in costume, and so they gave us costumes this one time so we could <laughs> actually film on the stage. So I actually got to be in the passion play for a couple times, but but then it, which, that was so much fun. But um, but it's hot in, under these clothes in, in August in Arkansas, and you're trying to film and hide the thing, you know. But uh, they also let us film rehearsals, so that that allowed us to get perspectives that you wouldn't normally get from the audience. So the film is constantly moving for front of stage, back you know, back of stage, that kind of stuff. But um, I guess. The original question about how things changed, I, I can say one thing that was totally fascinating, when we made this short, we brought it back to Eureka Springs, and uh, we showed it, and the, the pushback was from the LGBT community. They were like, what the heck are you spending so much time with these evangelicals up at the Passion Play? Because they, what they thought is we were making a civil rights issue film, and so, when they saw it, they were like, what the heck? Like, mm -hmm. you're, you're juxtaposing community. Like, it, it was a, it was, a, people weren't prepared to see what they were going to see. And so they really got upset. And it was strange because they were saying things like, you know, you're showing, you're showing the evangelicals up on the hill and, you know, Christ is rising, but then it's like Sodom and Gomorrah at this bar. And it was like, hold on a second. Drag is spiritual. What are you talking about? Like you had to, I was like, for me, you know, unpacking the logic of that was crazy. But this is a 15-minute film that we showed, and then there was like an hour and a half long discussion. It was totally nuts. It was like, like the craziest city council meeting ever, or whatever. And we were just like, oh my god. And, but we were, I was con just, I was so blown away by this response that I did not understand. We just, we all talked through it. And by the end, people were like, I want to see that movie again. You know, like they were like, oh, okay. So it was like a weird kind of like, it's the wrong word, but I th hope this comes across like, like there's like visual literacy, right? So the idea of like, there's ways of watching films where 
you can just watch it for the subject matter, but you can also watch in between the lines and the ways that the filmmaker is speaking to you, and there's many different ways that the filmmaker speaks to you. And so I think in this case, the, the framework for this screening was wrong. It was just like, hey, come celebrate diversity, and we, we passed this law, and now let's see the movie that celebrates the passing of this law, and then instead they're getting this like crazy you know, thing. It's interesting. And then once you talk to people about it, they, they're like, oh, okay. So the framing devices always matter. You know, how you, how you choose to present the film is, is important to how people receive the film. What's interesting, though, is that you, you noticed, and you know, you've only had a, you've had some screenings before. You, you premiered at... at, this, at uh, this was South at by South Southwest. South by, right? Yeah. At South by Southwest, and now you're having screenings here and other festivals, but that it, it is a film that really engenders conversation. It's a film that, after it's over, people stay in their seats. They want to discuss it. They don't leave. So, you know, most films, like, at least half the audience will leave. But this is the film where people stay in their seats and they want to discuss it. And that's the important thing about these films because the whole reason for engagement or the discussion afterwards mm -hmm. is um, just as important as the film because it's able to bring the community together and the audience together. Let's say that. Um, does that happen with your, with your film, Lindsay, or are you... Yeah, actually, feeling that with the screening. Yeah, we we haven't had that many screenings yet. Um, it's been, I guess, four screenings we've had so far, and um, every time I would say like eighty percent of the audience stays for you know until we're kicked out. Basically, <laughs> it's like okay, we have another showing. You guys gotta leave. Um, so people are really engaged, and that feels good. Yeah, and I think with Gilda, this is Gilda. Is this your premiere? No, this is it's just not. our second festival. Okay. Um, we just premiered, well, premiered on in Florida, Monday right? in Florida, and um, at first I was really bummed I didn't get to premiere at South By, but honestly we weren't even ready yet. Um, but the really cool thing about our premiere on Monday, which was April 9th, was the exact same day that MLK was laid to rest 50 years ago. And then when I started Googling about April 9th, it was also 153 years to the day that General Lee surrendered the Confederacy officially at Appomattox. So it was, you know, sometimes maybe there's another force up there that, that times when you're supposed to have your premiere. And the other wonderful thing about it is, is that we premiered in, um, in Desmond's backyard. So that was great. He was able to, to come then and all of, all of his group, which is um, called the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, Coalition or FRRC. That's so great, yeah. Um, Betsy, do you want to talk about what your your work is now? Is it Does it intersect with yeah, these Yeah, very issues? much. What The things that I'm really concerned with are um, something you mentioned, that there are different ways of looking at documentaries, obviously, and that this is a very sophisticated audience at this festival, and most festivals you go to are sophisticated audiences, and what happens is that the vast majority of people that might get to see these films, because they're hard to see in many cases, um, are uh, not necessarily going to have the um, experience with looking at cinema that someone here might. And that this context of how people have regarded documentaries over the over 100 years that they've been in existence um, to the place we are now. That's why I was asking about the funding. I wasn't asking a general, okay, how did you fund the movie question? But, I mean, it's a good answer. But um, how does our particular society now create opportunities for these documentaries to be made? And what are the differences between that and other kinds of societies? And then at the other end, how do we get them seen in a mass um, situation when there's so much media going on? And my particular work right now is I've been um, tracing the development of documentaries um, being made through uh, from the very beginning uh, in the silent era in the Soviet Union when obviously they were made with a political and artistic perspective 
um, how they were financed, in that case by a government, where our government virtually has no financing for nonfiction except for the military. And by the way, the military films everything they do. They always have. Um, the military and the NFL were the largest users of 16 millimeter film during the history of 16 millimeter film. Um, so then how do we, in this particular society, um, because I'm looking at how, th how people work together in a documentary community to create an environment where you can get the film made, which is something you relied on heavily and what IDA does a lot, yeah. um, and then get the films out to places and people that would not ordinarily show up at a 10 a.m. Saturday conversation about social issue films. Well, I was just going to say, uh, for for my film, I, I started off thinking I was just going to keep all my expenses super cheap, you know, buy a camera, do it myself. It was just a short. And then as it got bigger and bigger and bigger, I was like, okay, I definitely need some cash if I'm going to finish this thing. And so we had a Kickstarter campaign, and that went, went really well. Um, it didn't come close to covering all my expenses, but it was a huge chunk of it. And, and I also did apply for a bunch of grants. I didn't get any of them, and it was a lot of you know, time, obviously. Um, and now that I'm in the distribution phase, I'm kind of starting to see sort of the same. I think some of the grants that we applied for, um, it was like, oh, this is a sort of a controversial subject matter, not because it's about climate change, but because it's, you know, the main character is breaking the law. Um, and some of the ways in which the distribution happens for social action films are through companies like Patagonia or something like that that can actually fund um, work that aligns with their mission as a company, but they don't want to touch something that is about someone who's going out and breaking the law. So I'm, I'm, what I'm finding is that I'm probably going to end up uh, getting it out in the world similar to how I got it made, which is with the people who really want to see it and step up as individuals. So it's going to be kind of a grassroots thing so we're pushing community screenings really hard right now through churches and climate action groups. And um, if anyone has ideas or wants to show the film in their community, please talk to me. <laughs> oh. Do you have a distributor? I have an educational distributor. And I do not have a, a traditional distributor yet, but I'm definitely looking for one. And with the educational distributor, um, do any kind of outreach in the schools as well? or They do a lot of outreach mostly to colleges. To colleges. So environmental education programs and environmental law, that kind of thing. Yeah. And do they make money? Do they make money well? Yeah. In, in distribution. And do you make any money back to cover some of your expenses in distribution? I mean, what what is the system? Well, we're, it's early days. I think if I end up covering all my hard costs, I'll consider myself really lucky. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> and and the hard cost wouldn't include your time. No, no, no. Not that doesn't include my time at all. So it's all <laughs> or donated time. Is yeah, yes. yeah. I think we see that you know what's connected is this issue of sustainability. You know, not only for the field but for the filmmaker. So in order for you to make these films, you know, your own sustainability has to be accounted for, and um, and how do you do that? It's a it's a dilemma. You know, probably everyone here, or you're the filmmakers here, you have to really have another job to make a living, and then you make this film. Mm -hmm. You know, Mike does commercial work, and Lindsay, I'm not sure what you do to sustain yourself. Gilda, you still work, you work in television. Well, and actually, you know, the short that we have here is part of my strategy to try to raise money. Because that film is not finished. I'm considering, you know, and I do hope you come and see it, I'm considering that's act one. Act two is going on right now as they're leading this huge grassroots campaign because um, Desmond and his group did get a million signatures and it's coming up to vote in Florida to re-franchise felons uh, in November 2018. So I should be filming right now. And then act three is going to be on November 6, 2018 during our midterm elections. So it's frustrating to me as a filmmaker because if you're making something that's happening right now, these traditional channels of grant writing, I mean even having the time to do a Kickstarter campaign, like as you said the time is you know donated free, that's a huge amount of manning social networking to try to get to you know hopefully your 20 grand or stuff. Well you know I need couple hundred thousand dollars at least. So um, it's, it's always making a pitch 
So any of you out here that want a producer credit, come see me. Um, we're fully tax deductible through the International Documentary Association, um, who fiscally sponsored us. And, and that's a great incentive in business model, because normally if you know a documentary is not going to make that money on the back end, so that you know some of your investors might come in like on a feature and you might be saying, OK, you, know, you give me 300,000, you're going to get whatever, 40% of the take. No one generally expects that with the documentary. So the wonderful thing about the International Documentary Association and fiscal sponsorship is right away you're getting a tax deductible donation. Instead of taking a risk, you know, you're getting whatever it is, your 30% or whatever off your, off your taxes. Um, so um, yeah, it's a hard road. My credit cards are maxed out. <laughs> And uh, I'm really living, uh, living the dream here. <laughs> There's some hands up for questions. Yes. Yeah, I have a question. I'm sorry to interrupt the, the panel, but have you ever mm. thought of putting, uh, I'm probably thinking more of a sh the short film, uh, have you thought of putting it online uh, in a, on a, you know, maybe as a, as a way for you to keep it as an episode and that people mm -hmm. can, you know, use it as a mm -hmm. social media tool and, and make sure that you can get donation or mm -hmm. that the next step can happen. Is it a possibility? Well, we're going to be building that with like the trailer that you saw. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the full film, um, I think we're going to try to keep it a little more under wraps to maybe explore like what you're saying, sponsored viewings and things like that, mm -hmm. that we haven't yet. Because if it's all ready, if people can already see the whole thing, then, you know, why are they going to go to the... The idea is because it's a very, uh, uh, very present uh, yes. current, so yes. you want the reaction to happen right away to be able to... Exactly. I'm hoping the trailer will, yeah. will do that to, to some degree. Really take time, for sure. Yes, yes. All, all of it takes so much time. It's crazy. <laughs> Thank you. I wanted to go back. Uh, my name is Richard Blue. Uh, my brother James Blue made the documentary of the March in 1963. And... Every time I show it in schools, I have to get permission from the King estate because the YouTube version that was restored by the National Archives, this I Have a Dream speech is redacted completely. It's a copyright issue. Every time I show it to a church or a school group, they say, you got to get this into the schools. So I showed it to my granddaughter's school, 75% black students in the school where she goes. And the teacher said, who was 35 years old, said, gee, I can't show this film and talk about it without a teacher guide because I don't have the history myself of this. Mm -hmm. And so then I said, okay, well, we'll see if we can get the teacher guide. It's written, well, that couple hundred thousand dollars, you know, <laughs> later. And wow. I'm still not sure I've got a system by which I can get this into schools widely dispersed with teacher guides. And I think for all of the documentaries that you guys have been making, they should be in the schools. Because when you're dealing with adult audiences, you know, you have to be very careful about not turning them off in the first five minutes. Because everybody comes in with their prejudices and biases and skepticism. But at least in a school, kids are still open-minded and they can begin to appreciate the complexities of social issues. They can begin to appreciate the courage that it takes to stand up for something right. So I just wondered if you've, if you've thought could about I, this could issue. Can I comment on that, please? Um, if it, it's okay. I used to write a lot of teacher's guides when I was in distribution for educational and documentary and independent films. And what has happened, and Claire, I think, could, uh, with her vast experience, back me up on this. There used to be distribution companies that would take on the job of writing all of the teacher study guides and packaging the film and creating art and getting it out and return a modest amount to the filmmakers, something between 30 and 40 percent of what they netted. That market has almost gone away because everything is so readily available in so many different media. There are still educational, if you want to talk about it, I'm happy to talk with you about it, where um, institutions sign up for streaming services through educational things. But what's happened for the filmmaker is that it's now incumbent on them to create, as you have discovered, their own study guides, their own websites. They're not to, you now have to fund the film, make the film, 
um, and go out and promote the film, but you have to, in a sense, create all these educational materials and become a distributor to get the work even seen. And there are some companies that still do it. Yeah, there's yeah. some companies that still do that. Um, you know, like Women Make Movies and... Um, Clay Moss was just saying at a film movement where she's working there, they're doing that outreach. Rocco Films does that for the education. But in terms of the return to the filmmaker, it's not the same. Yeah, it's, it still, a, it's still a component, absolutely, of every film I've ever made is, it, is the educational distribution a- angle of it. So it, it, the films always go in there. They go in at a certain stage of the film's release or whatever. But, um, but now there's much less money um, and then a lot of times, if you're lucky, you get contacted by by a, uh, a teacher at a university or at a high school. It's like, hey, uh, I can I, I found a pirated copy of your film. Can I show it and like like donate some money? And it's like, yeah, go for it, whatever. Like, I mean, at this point, it's it really is that's not a way of making money, you know. But but it should be. Yeah. yeah but that's I think you're absolutely right. I mean, like. I, I love it when when the films get to that that place that that matters a lot, but it actually it, this raises like this whole conversation like raises for me it's like wow this is really weird because um, I, it, it's almost like I'm more traditionalist than possibly anybody at the table talking about it right now is I, I honestly feel like if you're lucky enough to make a film that you at the beginning, you get into festivals. The festivals start to create the buzz around a film, and then that pushes, hopefully, towards you know a distributor wanting the film and deals being struck so that the film can get out there. But um, part of the reason why filmmakers it's such a big deal where they start showing their film is because it drives the press. And when the press writes about your film, your film then has a profile. And I wish there was a way of a, around that, but I do not see a way around that other than what you guys were describing, which in many ways, more people see the films in your model than even me putting a film out like in New York and LA with a major distributor, et cetera. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the community screenings are going to be key for us. And, yeah. um, you know, find, I, what I'm trying to work on hard is finding promotional partnerships who have an interest, who love the film, who want their members to see it, to help promote that, hey, this is available. And there are a lot of groups who would like to bring yeah. their community together to see a film that's impactful. So um, while we only have like, f- you know, four or five, we have five film festivals lined up so far, we have 20 community screenings yeah. in the next month. So. Um, yeah, we're trying to reach out. We're trying to reach out with to both the LGBT community and then also the religious community, which is a very strange, you know, <laughs> range. So it's like the crossover. But that's that's the point, right? That is the point. You know, that that's yeah. be amazing if it works. Just, well, just just one thing before I take another question: that there are some there are some companies that are that are helping with community screenings or, or doing that as their emphasis, like like Tug, and there are also some. Very interesting online um, on um, software programs for community screenings, like OV at ITVS, and if people want to know about that, which is a whole new area. But just in terms of the filmmakers, I'm taking notes, Claire. The film <laughs> Tug and O what OV O V E E. But in terms of what the return of the filmmakers, that's still a challenge because it's enormous amount of sweat equity for you. And also, it's not like recompensed in the way that it is having a great distribution deal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and and you're trying to like I I tried to put the price point so that like the people who are putting on the events have at least a little bit of skin in the game to make sure they advertise it and get people there. Like they're not just like oh yeah I forgot about that thing only five people showed up. <laughs> um, it, you know, and and it might make a little drop in the bucket in terms of you know how paying back my expenses, but th- but it's still, you know, $150 for a church is a lot of money, so it's a little bit of a balancing act, too. Yeah, great. There was a question there? Yes. Yeah, so I've been really inspired lately by some Netflix docu-series, mm-hmm. um, one called Flint Town on Flint, Michigan, and another, produced by a, a local producer, um, and Wild Wild Country, another docu-series. Um, on Netflix, and I'm wondering if part of our documentary, you know, storytelling challenge is to look at the format 
and how does that get, mm -hmm. you know, how does that help us in finding funding and all those kinds of things. I'm wondering if the filmmakers here could talk a little bit about how they discovered their format. Did the, did the format choose you? You know, how did that work? Uh, subject, subject matter determines the format, probably. I mean, uh, sometimes it's a short film, sometimes it's a longer film, sometimes it's a series, sometimes it's this or that. And there's definitely, like you say, there's a million different avenues now. I mean, I'd I mean, my God, I would love to do a six-part Netflix documentary series that's like, you know, but I could imagine also that taking nine years of my life on one subject. <laughs> so I was like, oh boy, I don't know. But I also like the just personally, I, I very much enjoy the short form as well as the feature length f film form. Um, just as forms, I like them. A 75 minute, 80 minute film has a sort of structure and, and a style that I just, I enjoy. So I enjoy making those things, but I also like making the 10 minute and stuff like that. But yeah, so I guess for me, it just, it's the subject matter determines where it goes. Anybody else? Yeah, um, actually I know that, that, that Flint documentary, and it's great, and Netflix has, I, you know, I love their taste. They have they, great, great people over there. Um, I did go and pitch them before we went out, and they were one of the ones that said, you know, just too short a runway for us to get into it in a corporate kind of model, because, you know, there's whole layers of executives, and what are they going to, to green light? So I think that's one of the things that you face as a documentarian. If you are really, really passionate about your subject and you don't have time to go through, you know, is the corporate head going to decide to greenlight you, then you kind of have to just, just go. Um, and um, I'm now hoping to go back to Netflix and say, okay, we just, you know, you passed on it before because, you know, I understand you didn't have enough lead time, but, you know, what do you, what do you think, think now? Um, but I also agree that it does depend on the subject matter, like for example the thing with Flint, Michigan, you're talking about the police department, and they cast a whole bunch of characters and they decided to follow them, you know, over a, a long period of time. Um, you know, I think like for, for Lindsay's film, it was a thing with a beginning, middle, and end. It was a particular protest, it sounds like, about the ship coming in. Well, so no, not really. No, I mean, I haven't a, seen it yet. It was a you know, year and a half of Ken's life, and it, was, it life, covered yeah. multiple protests. Yeah, uh, I thought I was making a short, and then um, I ended up making a much longer film. And um, sort of my work process is to then like, oh, okay, it's dragging here. Let's make it shorter and mm -hmm. shorter and shorter. And so um, it ended up being right around a good time for a feature, which is seventy-seven minutes. Um, I, I think it. You know, in terms of distribution, it might be better if it was more like an hour or 52, because I think the educational component is going to be pretty huge, and 77 minutes is kind of long for a typical classroom. They'd have to split it up in order to have a discussion afterwards. I wonder yeah, if. You, oh, sorry. Go oh, ahead. I'm I didn't sorry. see you have the mic. Yeah, you're, you're next. Right. No, sorry, ma'am. Okay. She has the you're mic. Right. Yes. You all are so talented, and I, I look at the shorts, and I'm thinking. Um, uh, or the clips, and I'm thinking, you're probably so multi-talented. For those of us who don't feel we have the ability to do the editing, to do the filming well, and to do other aspects, can you talk a little bit about collaborating? And when it's so much easier when you know what you want to do and you have a vision of what you want to look like, but getting there is tough mm -hmm. for some of us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love collaborating personally, <clears throat> um, and I didn't get to do enough of it on this film, mostly because I was trying to keep my expenses down, and so I was like, I'll wear this hat, and I'll wear this hat, and then um, eventually I got to a place where I could collaborate a little bit, and that was by far and away the, um, where the film really shined, and um, you know, you, you don't have great skills in all the areas of filmmaking, you just, you have your specialties, you know, <laughs> so. Um, I'm hoping that one of the things that comes out of this for me is meeting other filmmakers who I might want to collaborate with in the future. Sure there were neighbors. I know, we're like, oh, we like, both live in cool. Portland. <laughs> so um, to come to festivals Let's like this. Let's lose some money together. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, I'm a great editor. You're probably a great cinematographer. That could work well, you know? <laughs> so um, that's, my, you know, one of my goals is to find like-minded people who want to do the same kind of films and um, pool our talents. So. Yeah. 
Okay, we have our next question uh, back can here. Can I just answer one thing on that one? Um, it just, filmmaking is absolutely a team sport. You cannot no way do it yourself. If you have an artistic vision that you want to do yourself, novelist, painter, you know, but, but this is a team sport. And one of uh, my mentors who um, I worked for when I started out as a producer was Adrian Malone of the BBC. He um, actually uh, created Cosmos series with the first one with Carl Sagan. And he kept teaching me, and I didn't get it when he said this. He goes, filmmaking is everybody making the same mistake at once. <laughs> and I, I didn't get it, but now I kind of like to flip that around to the positive, like filmmaking is making the right choices, everybody makes the right choices at once, but, you know, just find your group and you're going to learn as you go through it, you know, find people that want to um, sharpen their skills in, in the cinematography or the editing or the graphics or the sound, and then, but, but you as the filmmaker need to hold the vision for them. That's one thing I find, because once you do get that group, everybody's going to have an idea, and they're going to, like, down to, okay, I, don't, I think we should shoot on HD instead of 4K, and why are we using those lenses? Little minutia things, but you as the director visionary, you have to, you know, make the call so that everyone makes the same mistake all at once. I, I, feel, I feel compelled to just offer one slightly counter opinion, and that is um, because the stuff that we do there is no money. Uh, my my background is you know I started in all sorts of special effects and then I went into other film stuff and so I learned on the job and just learned all of the aspects of filmmaking. I have directed large set related things where you have a hundred people working for you. I found those things to be incredibly wasteful and strange and you know the product the end result that you're making is okay, it's amazing, we made the commercial, great. But when it comes to making something that you're passionate about, I think you could also consider just, just go at it. Like all the tools are available to you. Editing is doing four things over and over and over again <laughs> for three years. It's just about what you're thinking, you know? Um, and shooting also, I mean, there are so many films that I've seen that are so badly shot yeah. that are incredible because of what they're saying. Yeah. yeah. You know? That's like there's mantra. just a million like mm -hmm. it's the, this is the one form that still exists where filmmakers in large part are free. It's the reason why I do it. It's the reason I don't do fiction because I'm in control of it. I shot that film, I edited that film, I scored that film, you know, with one other person <laughs> who is the co-director who I work with all the time. And then we, this is the only time I think I ever worked with another camera person for some of the shoot because there's no money. But it doesn't mean it's the only way to do it because my God, I mean, if I had, like the way, you're, you're describing going, is it in, it's an entirely different way of going at it, which yeah. I would love because I to had do. Because I had to move a lot faster. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's the thing. And that's incredible depends, that you got that opportunity. It depends what your timeline yeah. is. Totally. But I to hats yeah. off to you, that's like amazing. Yeah, but then you're also in the most awesome position because you do have Act One. And now you can go back to these people and they already know you. Yeah. And they've already, you've already had the conversation. It's like totally gonna happen. That's totally going to happen. Thank you. Yeah. The, the other thing you got to yeah. keep in mind on a shoot is um, the kind of access you have. And uh, I think what makes my film strong is that Ken is a super authentic person and was willing to share all kinds of things that were going on in his head that were quite private. And I'm not sure if that would have happened if it had been me and a camera person and a sound person with the boom. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> okay, I think we're going to try and take a comment back here. Okay. You're next, sir. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> okay, this, is, this is for Gilda. Um, my question is, I, I haven't seen, of course, your film, so I don't know whether you have covered the issue and the relationship between uh, felons not being able to vote with the mass incarceration, Jim Crow, police misconduct, mm -hmm. all the rest of that. 
And I'm wondering, since to me that's a, it's a huge piece of it, is, is not just mm -hmm. anybody who got all these felony convictions, it's African American men, right. largely. Um, so I'm wondering whether you have found that donors are more interested if those two things are linked to make that link for white audiences. Um, yes, actually we do have a short section in there um, where we, you know, try to quickly explain without too much like geeking out as, a, you know, on a history level is that this did all come from the Jim Crow era. This came after the Civil War in the South when the newly freed slave in the restoration period, they made what were called the Jim Crow laws, which I had always heard about, but I didn't really realize basically how pervasive they were through the state constitutions in the South. And um, so, so we do get a little bit into that. And you know, things that I learned in that, which, which we didn't have time yet to put in this short film, was that in, in those days, I mean, I think it was really up to probably the 1960s, um, where if you were a minority, if you were particularly you know, black, you came to the polls, you wanted to vote, the registrar would sit there and there'd be a glass jar of jelly beans on the table. And they would say, okay, if you, or cotton balls. And they would say, if you can guess the exact number of jelly beans or cotton balls in this jar, we will let you vote. So it's, it, it is completely threaded in there. And, um, you know, it, it's really, you know, in, in some of the press materials that, that I'm writing is that um, it really is time to abolish these laws that are still on the books from the Jim Crow days. So thank you for that question. Right, yes, sir. <laughs> I have the mic in my hand. <laughs> so, uh, Lindsay, a couple nights ago, we spoke about this, about how your film gives us an opportunity to come to know Ken. And as Siskel and Ebert used to say about fictional films, when you, when you get to know enough of the character, then you care what mm -hmm. happens to him. And that's what happened in yours. Mm -hmm. What I want to comment on is it related to how it grew and how it became a year and a half project. Some of that was because there were other actions happening around the country and places. But a lot of time, and this is what I'd love you to comment on, was the time it took for you to film and let us get to know the significant women in his life and his son and things about his youth and all of that. That's what made us really come alive. This isn't just a guy who's out there in a Santa suit, you know, protesting Exxon Mobil. This is a guy that we come to like. He's an amazing guy. So that took time and it took money. Can you comment on that a little bit? The importance of that part of it for yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, it definitely took time, and, but mostly it was about um, just the kind of person that Ken is. It's kind of weird to talk about him in third person because he's right over there. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> So he was just, he was always really um, open with me. I think that's just the kind of person he is. And that was true from the very first conversation we had. And I'm, you know, as a, as a filmmaker, I'm always on the lookout for those kind of people because you can, someone can have an amazing story, but if they're not willing to share it with you or if they can't put a sentence together, they're not a good person to be in your film. Um, and that wasn't the case for Ken. He was quite articulate and he was really open about sharing things that were quite personal and also quite um, difficult, you know? He, he was willing to be vulnerable in front of the camera. You made the choice to go there, which is what's, what I'm trying to say. You made the choice to go deep as to who he is. Yeah. That, I mean, that was the whole point. That was the whole point is, is to use the character as... Um, character, sorry, Ken, as, as a way to draw the audience in into the issues, like why is this so important and what is the effect on him and his life, you know, to put himself out there to, to take these actions. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks. This is for um, Michael. You mentioned kind of the, the viewpoint uh, of the filmmaker of where you're going. And um, I kind of really appreciated where you were talking about looking at the, the commonalities between people and bringing that story out rather than the diversity issue. And I think there is a lot of momentum right now to, to polarizing and making people into the other rather than saying they're part of the same family. And does that 
you uh, ran into some resistance with that uh, initially, uh, that, that you were uh, viewing the evangelicals as well as the LGBT people. Um, when you're going out looking for funding, do you see that there's, that there's uh, funders and, and other people interested in looking at this viewpoint of, of finding our similarities? Um, I think oh, this is a hard question to answer. Um, I think on some level it has to do with marketing. So it's easier to market a film that is about a subject matter that you can bullet point really quickly and easily. And so I think it's, and those, and those films should exist and they're important. Um, those films often naturally get funded uh, by, by some organizations and not by others. And it's by no means the entirety of the thing. Um, there's plenty of grant organizations that are out there that take risks. And there's so many filmmakers out there that are taking crazy risks and doing crazy stuff. It is extremely hard, at least for us, what we're doing, it's too complicated to, to easily describe what, if, if I were just to explain the plot of this film or any other film I made, people would be like, wait, what? You know, and then it would be just gone. So you end up kind of reducing what it is that you're doing in, at that stage of like going after funding to, it's about inclusivity and people living together. You know, it's like dogs and cats living together. You know, it's like you're selling, you know, the thing. <laughs> But in reality, you're doing something more com complicated than that. But you have to sort of f find ways of writing about it. Uh, and then most of the time, you don't get the, those grants anyway. So, you know, and it, but it does nothing for me in terms of uh, what I'm actually trying to find or do. It doesn't, like, I don't change w what it is I'm making to make the film because I feel like if anything's worth going after, it is gonna be complicated and it is gonna be hard to describe. And if you frame it right, at the end, when somebody sees it, they go, oh my God, it's, yeah, duh, I totally get it. Because, you know, people get it. I, I mistakenly said visual literacy earlier. I really should have said frame, like the framing that you give an audience as a filmmaker. So if you set up a film right, you can set up the conditions for people to really go into like weird spaces with you. But it has, you have to have, hopefully you, you, you have a sure hand in the first five, 10 minutes of setup. It's always in the setup, right? I mean, my God, I can't tell you how many times I've spent re-editing the beginning of, you know, movies. It just goes on and on and on because the setup matters the most because it's the framework by which everyone's gonna watch. But then you can go deep with it after that. I hope that's a helpful answer. Change of subject. Since we have Ken and his partner here, I would really like to know how we're going to hear from them. Can they speak now? Or <laughs> is it, are you somewhere else that we can talk with you? I think this is an awesome opportunity. Would you like to say something, Ken? <laughs> What's it like to have someone follow you around with a camera? Oh, wow. <laughs> It was pretty fascinating. Um, the most interesting thing about listening to all this is the parallels between doing activism and doing documentary filmmaking, which is nobody gives you a grant to shut down four or <laughs> five oil pipelines either. You have to figure out how to pay for it yourself, and then having done it, um, you have to, you know, then you have to try to make money back afterwards. And having a documentary about what we did is one, you know, excellent vehicle for for us to be able to, in a very narrow sense, try to raise some funds to pay our legal costs. So that's, that's been the most interesting thing. Um, this is Laura, who appears in the movie as um, kind of the Greek chorus. At one point, Lindsay said, I can't really focus too much on you because you're kind of too much of a character that people can't relate to. We have to have some real people in there. And Laura was one of the real people. <laughs> Often an irascible subject also, because like, is she here again? <laughs> no. Meaning Lindsay. Oh. Huh. So hopefully 
hopefully you'll join us for at the end of the panel when people want to say hello. <laughs> Yeah. Hi. Um, thanks so much for this great panel. It's really great. I've only seen one of the films, but I really, really enjoyed it. And this is sort of related to, to having Ken here, but um, I, I, my question was about sort of the, the how to get hundreds of thousands of people to see your film, right? And so you've talked about community screenings. Um, and I just base this on my own viewing, you know, I view on, you know, PBS, Amazon, Netflix, and what am I forgetting? You know, some of the other, and, and YouTube, of course, you know. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if any of you could speak to like, if you're, <clears throat> if you're, you know, if anybody has approached you from any of those platforms, or if you've approached them. And then also, if you've thought about just, you know, self-distributing with like, you know, 199 to see this film to get it to hundreds of thousands of people, and then follow up with Ken. You know, what's it like? The idea of hundreds of thousands of people, or even millions, seeing you. <laughs> you know, and that that goes along with that. So, but first, the filmmakers. Uh, so yeah, so we're in the process of trying to get that traditional distribution now so that we can get more people to see it. That's the whole point, getting it, as many people to see it as possible. Um, and so like one of the reasons I'm not just going to put it on YouTube for free is it would, I feel like, just get completely lost there. Um, and may not garner much of an audience at all. And if I have any shot at traditional distribution, I have to like, play this game of the festivals and show that it, it has support and that it, people are excited to see it um, in hopes that I can get some of those deals that are going to put it, you know, on Netflix in front of people who are actively looking for a documentary. Um, and then there's absolutely no guarantee that that will happen. So at some point I have to say, okay, I played the game and time is running out and now I'm just going to go to the self-distribution mode. Um, but we're not there yet. So, so the PBS has a for documentaries. There's POV and there's Independent Lens, which are both great and also both super competitive and difficult to get into their programming. Um, and then there's the way to get sponsored by a local station and put on the air. And that is like the craziest racket of all. <laughs> yeah, let, yeah. I don't know if any of you. Well, you work with PBS, but basically they want you to pay them sixty thousand dollars to maybe have your show picked up by random um, you know, stations across the country and you never see a dime from that. Okay. So I'm kind of like, just on principle, not gonna do that. I had, it... I had one, one idea for you. Yeah, good, come on. I need all the ideas. Uh, Leonardo get. DiCaprio, yeah. he has a company called Appian Way and he's completely focused on environmental films. And, um, you know, and you know, like I'm from I'm from Hollywood, and so the cachet of having a celebrity name on your EP line just changes the complete game. So you have his number? Yeah, I I, I, I have I have the email to his guy. Oh, yeah, good. yeah. Talk to me. And then for you, I'm thinking RuPaul. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah, Let, um, let's let's pair them with some celebrities. Let's get these things sold. <laughs> We're actually doing all right with this one in terms of, but we did, it's funny, um, the, the people from Logo actually heard about the film before it had premiered at South yeah. By, and they were really hounding us to, to share it with them, but you know, it, as is the way that you typically do these things, you, when you, you hold everything until your premiere, and, and then you get the, the distributors and all these people to come to see your film, and then that generates the conversation, et cetera. One, and I just want to quickly speak to the earlier question. One of the things, most interesting things I saw at South by this year was that Amazon, for the films that were in the competitions, which, which ours was one of them, there was a standing offer of $85,000 for first rights digital, right? And this is the interesting thing. So, that, so, that, so I could have easily just said, okay, here you go. And then they like take it and they, put it on Amazon, okay. But you're also trying to deal with getting a distributor and putting the film out in theaters. What the distributors were doing, this is the, the distributors are taking that deal and they're saying, 
they're turning it around, they're saying, we will put your film in theaters and we will fund it with the Amazon deal, which is precisely what Amazon wants them to do. So they're actually doing something very interesting for the theatrical release of films, but just in this very odd way. That took, it takes some time to get your head around it, but it's like, oh, that's interesting. Now you're obviously sacrificing. Um, it depends on the distributor that you work with, right? So a distributor typically takes, you know, uh, it's like a, if you're lucky, it's like a 50-50 split. And then the, the American television deal is carved out of that. Because the most money that a filmmaker makes in the United States is this, the television sale to like POV or ITVS or Logo or RuPaul or World of Wonder, you know, like, you know, so there's a million ways to do that, right? Um, so this is a weird, complicated model that involves first theatrical, then television, then digital, then educational, then second uh, digital, like Netflix, Hulu, Amazon uh, Prime, or whatever, you know? OK, I think we've so, got a, another yeah. comment over here. Thank you. My name's Jonathan. I, too, have been in special effects and set, set construction in Hollywood and what have you. What I keep hearing over and over is the funding, the funding. There's no money. And you're a very funny person, Michael. I really like your humor. You can just tell that you radiate a certain comedy. I'd like to see a documentary on funding. I mean, it's just like the, the Martin <laughs> Spurloff, you know, when he did the. I was uh, not uh, watched that no. film. <laughs> I, actually, there's a, there's a fiction <laughs> film I want to make about this. Actually, where like two filmmakers are making a film about uh, an an aging couple and. And they're taking it to funders, and the funders are like, well, you know, there's not enough drama, you know. Maybe, maybe if one of them died. <laughs> you know. I love Mark, uh, Spurloff's movie about just product <laughs> placement. He walks in with his jacket all late, you know, on uh, late night TV with it, all these products tied and what have you. Hilarious. If we could use humor, because sometimes these documentaries, I love them, but I get so depressed. <laughs> well, this I, one's funny. Ours is funny. Well, I will see I it. I'm sorry. Funny moments, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're... Okay, uh, great, fantastic, because we need humor so badly. I agree. Great point, we'll take it. I think we have time for one more question. Who shall we take? Let's see. I think my student. <laughs> She's dictating. Okay, so a lot of the festival audiences, we're building a bi you're building a bigger choir. And maybe the community audiences, you're hopefully changing some minds. I'm also thinking that the lawmakers really need to, I'm a little emotional, <laughs> the lawmakers really need to see these films. Has that ever crossed your mind as a audience? And I know we're dealing with a lot of futility in this country right now, but I was wondering if you ever thought, because every issue that's on the table here has to do with some law that in my mind is unjust. Have you ever thought about like barraging the lawmakers with these films and, and everybody in the audience as well? You know, whatever petitions you sign, you know, hey, please watch this because maybe your mind and heart can be changed. Yeah, I'm actually, um, I've actually been hoping to get Representative John Lewis on board and also Andrew Young. Um, so I've kind of started to reach out. I met Andrew Young following up on that. Um, and then also um, I'm going to have the honor of attending a dinner next week with uh, Representative Lewis. So... Because I keep leaving messages to his press person and they never call back. <laughs> but great idea. Somebody else? And there are lots of ways that you can Is there any build in. Add, oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to finish by saying, and, and we should, you should be your last question because we're running out of time, that there are lots of ways where you can build an advocacy for your film, either take it to the Hill or, and, um, and you can talk to me at IDA for that, um, okay. whether you want else? to. You know, be able to advocate to your representative or ways in which you can go to Washington with your film. So, sir, we'll take last question from you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to be giving, announcing a prize Sunday night that I'll be uh, raising money for, uh, matching dollars. I'm not a wealthy person, but there's a lot of concentration of wealth in America right now. Some of it is guilty feeling. And I wondered if the film festivals like this one that are in the top 20, uh, could somehow begin to invite philanthropists or representatives of philanthropists to attend independent film festivals where documentaries like yours are being shown and begin to create a network 
of relationships between filmmakers and the, uh, the people with money. I mean, you, there's, you know, Phil Knight up in Nike who can't find enough places to put money in Oregon. Uh, and he's got a son who has bought a, you know, an animation studio, I think, if I ever right. There are many people out there like that, and I just wondered if people like Richard and others who are organizing these things couldn't begin to bring together networks of philanthropists, wealthy people who could really then get involved in meeting the needs of you guys. Richard, Richard is here. <laughs> yes, that's a big job on your shoulders. <laughs> That's a, those are great words of hope for the, for the future for us. Thanks so much. And I want to thank our panelists for our Seeking Justice panel. Thank you so much, Betsy, Gilda, Lindsay, Mike. Thank you, Thanks, everybody. everybody.